Obadidim, and uh, the ones of each night are there, and that costs, that's a pound, I think, for that CD. Then there's um, a, a series that was conducted, that I conducted uh, several years ago, and uh, it was on walking with God, and if I remember rightly, this uh, was in Mount Zion, uh, in Lisbon here, that that was uh, conducted, and there was a series of meetings, and God really did bless during that, that week of meetings, and if you would like that, then you can see Paul uh, on that. And finally, uh, there's one on, on healing, um, and our brother, uh, the Reverend Jim Hagen, Jim is a dear friend, he's been a great help to us in a Christian walk, and uh, this is one called Healing of the Emotions. And perhaps, uh, as we've said on many occasions before, there are issues of deep hurt uh, that have occurred in your life where you've been uh, really uh, maybe abandoned or maybe abused or there's so many things now can happen in people's lives and although they become Christians sometimes these things can really be a break or a barrier to going forward with God and healing can be needed and God of course is the healer and this little series really speaks, I think there's two or maybe three, three messages on, uh, and, and they're called Healing of the Emotions, uh, Healing from Oppression, and then One on Deliverance. And they're very, very practical. And there is uh, plenty of illustrative material, that is, lives that have been totally changed through, uh, through ministry with them. So, Perhaps that would resonate with you. Maybe there's something there that you would feel, you know, that, that would maybe help me. So if you would like that, you can see Paul. They're all uh, to be paid for, unfortunately. But if you buy about 50 of them, Paul might give you a discount of, of, of a pound. He's shaking his head. But, um, uh, and he's saying no, by the way. <laughs> it's, not, it's not yes. Um, so if you see Paul and tell him to be compassionate and merciful... Uh, you wouldn't know, maybe, maybe he will. So you can see all those. Um, I don't think there's any other announcements. Uh, I think that's all, other than to say that there's a little box at the back to cover expenses. So I think that's you all. You can turn that all off. Stephen, please. Uh, it somehow affects the... Now, can I ask you, is anybody cold? Nobody cold. Anybody too warm? You, there's nothing more we can do for you. That's, <laughs> we have it at its coldest, and the fan's on full. That's all we can do. So we're trying our very best for you, all right? So you want to keep it like that, yes? You're all in agreement. That's good. We're going to turn to the book of Ephesians tonight in the New Testament. And the book of Ephesians, and we're going to go to the last chapter, the chapter 6. Ephesians and chapter Six. <coughs> Ephesians in chapter 6. And we're going to commence to read, please, from the verse 11. Ephesians chapter 6 and the verse 11. I'm just wondering, Paul, it might be better to have the door open. If you could open the door, maybe that would be, because it, it is warm. So if we open that, at least it'll let a wee bit of the cool from outside into us. So. Ephesians chapter 6, and we're commencing to read, please, at verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, 
and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Amen. And we know God will bless the reading of his word. Let's bow together in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come into your presence and before your throne tonight in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I do thank you, Lord, for who you are. I thank you for the greatness of your name. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would draw near to us by the power of the Holy Spirit. I pray, Lord, that again you would put a, a wall of protection, a seal upon us, Lord, a covering and a protection. And I pray, loving Father, that you would just fill this place with your divine presence. I pray and invite the Holy Spirit to come so that he can interpret God's word to our hearts. I pray that, Lord, you would open our hearts, that you would speak into them, and that, Lord, we would really clearly hear your voice. I pray that your word would be a guide and a light to us, to direct us through the journey of life, to protect us from all those things that our spiritual enemy would want to do upon us. So please help us, Lord. I give myself completely to you, and I ask for the sanctifying power of thy Spirit. And I pray for the gracious anointing of the Holy Ghost. Come, Holy Spirit, and have your way in this gathering. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. We have looked on previous nights in some of the chapters of the book of Ephesians. Whenever we come to chapter 2, we're speaking regarding conversion. You know where it says that, that we are saved by grace through faith, that not of ourselves, it is the gift of God. Chapter 3, we come into that passage, you remember, where Paul uh, knelt down to pray, and he prayed that the saints might be filled with all the fullness of God, and the great need that there was in this church for the saints to be encountering God and to be filled and be being filled with His love and presence. Then, of course, we come to chapter 5, and we discover there he tells us, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. It's a very practical book, the book of Ephesians. But when we come to the end of this book, at the very tail end of chapter 6, Paul introduces us to an arena that otherwise would be quite vague to us. But he brings immense clarity for every person who will become a true follower of the Lord Jesus. And this particular truth that we're going to look at tonight should help us immensely in our Christian walk, because any who have truly been converted discover that initially the general experience of the child of God is euphoria, joy, and a real honeymoon with God at conversion. It's the bliss of sins forgiven. It's the knowledge that we're going to heaven. It's the, it's the awareness that, that, that we're right with God. And that euphoria remains with Christians sometimes for a prolonged period. However, the inevitable comes in. And that is we're in a sinful world and we're still in a sinful body. And we're in a scenario where we have a spiritual enemy. And that enemy is active. He is not passive. The devil is never found to be relaxing, never found to be sleeping, but he is an ongoing enemy with determination and with avarice and hate and hostility 
and every dark demonic thought that could enter into uh, a, a being is in him. And so with this hatred, hostility, and anger in him, he works for the overthrow and for the destruction of the Christian. And Paul brings us to this very truth. And so I want to speak for a little time on Christian conflict. Christian conflict. The Bible says when Paul was writing to young Timothy, who was a convert of his, and you remember the book that was written, or a few books to Timothy, Paul, when addressing this young man to commence the ministry and go out really pastoring and leading others to the Lord and ministering to the church, this is what he said, Timothy, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Paul was not in any way ignorant of the fact that it was not going to be easy for young Timothy. The early church were very aware of the hostility. In fact, the church was born into conflict. And for those who, I trust that you make an effort to read somewhat of church history or have a general view of church history, it's very helpful uh, to really understand where we are today because church history reveals uh, just what the church has gone through. And in her early days after her formation, she went through immense persecution, where in the Colosseum in Rome, Christians were uh, thrown to the lions, they were uh, burned, they were used by Nero to make an entrance, uh, the great entrance to his uh, dwelling. Instead of having torches, he took Christians and tied them to poles, poured tar over them and lit them alive and burned them. And that's, that was the early church. So uh, when we think of the apostle Paul, we have to remember in the context that what we consider now to be persecution and when we talk about persecution, we have to have some sense of guideline as to what happens in past. But what is happening today in places like Saudi Arabia or countries where the Muslim faith is in dominance, where Christians are beheaded on a regular occurrence, where if they're found with a Bible, they're put to death or their hands are cut off. Um, we need to be aware of that as Christians. Because, as one person said regarding the media today, we are not only the most informed generation, we are the most misinformed. We are given what, what people want us to hear. And so we must seek to discover and find and have a balance on the truth. So he, he warns them about the hardness of being a soldier. Now, sometimes, um, certainly when I was growing up as a Christian, um, the older saints used to say, um, don't talk about the devil. Don't do any, don't, you know, don't mention him, don't get involved with him because you'll glorify him. Now, of course, there's an element of truth in that. That is, if you become obsessed with the devil, if you become obsessed with what he does, that is an unhealthy thing. However, to be ignorant of the devil is to be in a position of vulnerability as a Christian. I, the best illustration, I've used it frequently because I have never come across a better illustration, was that of Rommel. Rommel was the great German uh, commander who in the uh, southern belt of Europe was uh, defeating the Allies on a continual. He had them literally against the wall. And eventually, through constant defeat, then Montgomery was brought in, Bernard Montgomery, on behalf of the British and the Allies. Montgomery, of course, defeated Rommel. After a number of conflicts, he eventually routed him. When asked how he defeated Rommel, who had previously defeated all the British generals, How did you defeat Rommel? Montgomery said, I spent time 
looking at him, examining him, watching his tactics of the past, and by learning the traits of Rommel, he defeated him. And as Christians, we should have an eye like that commander Montgomery that has an insight to the devil, that understands how he operates, and then we can be overcomers of the devil. Whenever it comes to the things of the devil, um, people, uh, and this is perhaps not totally relevant for a young convert or a young Christian, but you see, as we mature as Christians, we lay hold on new truths. God, by his Holy Spirit, leads us as Christians into new classrooms. And those classrooms can be very exciting for us. Sometimes they can be very difficult for us. But God is a God who's always teaching his children. And so you have to go through the classroom. And you have to sit at your desk and you have to learn the lessons. And when you graduate, God will put you into another classroom. And you will mature and grow and become more Christ-like as you are a good student in God's school. And we discover sometimes as we mature that uh, this devil, this entity, is obviously real. And we maybe uh, uh, find ourselves in conflict experimentally, where we find ourselves in conflict with something that we haven't come across before. It's new, and it's difficult, and we can't quite grasp it. The Bible teaches us that we will have encounters with this power, not maybe directly. Some people say, the devil attacked me. I think that's to maybe elevate yourself a little higher than you are if we're to say the devil was against me, because the devil can only be in one place at one time. And I, I wouldn't like to state this categorically, but it's unlikely that maybe any of us have had a direct encounter with the devil. It's, it's probably unlikely. Um, it's a possibility, don't get me wrong, but, but what certainly is true is that you have encountered some of his army. There's no doubt about that. And you have encountered those powers that are under him, which we're going to look at briefly in a few moments. And so, when we come to the devil, there is, there is a truth that every Christian, young or old, must comprehend and must implicitly bring into line in their Christian walk. And that is, when we're dealing with the powers of darkness, as Christians, we don't ever act, but we react. What do I mean by that? I mean that you don't decide as a Christian, I'm on a great uh, a, a journey now. I'm, I'm going to attack the devil. I'm going to go full blast against the devil with everything I can. You never talk like that and you never do that because you are coming against an immense opponent. You are coming against something that is beyond your computation or mine. And so you never act. But what you do do is if, as you walk with God, the enemy comes in on your space, if he comes into your environment, if he comes to restrict you from doing God's will, then you react. In other words, you don't permit him to do that because he has no right to interfere with God's calling on your life. And so that is the arena where we are safe as Christians with the whole area of the demonic. I learned on one occasion, it stands out, I was uh, in the Lord's work and I remember something specifically was annoying me. And I knew the enemy was involved in it. And so one day in the car, very foolishly, I said to the devil, I said, all right, you think you can do that? Bring it on. <laughs> I'll never do that again. Never in my life. Because he brought it on. And the very thing that I challenged him on, he let rip on that thing. And God taught me it was not a major thing 
but it was so real that God taught me, you can't do that. You, can't, you have to respect these spiritual forces, not that you love them, not that in any way you would honor them, but you have to recognize that you are in no position as an individual to take them on unless God is specifically guiding and directing your path to do so. So when we come to this passage, first of all, when he's bringing us to the arena of conflict, he says to these Christians in uh, chapter 6 and verse 11, put on the whole armor of God. You see, what he's alluding to is that there's something that you and I have to do. He says, put on the whole armor of God. Why? He said, that ye may be able to withstand or stand against the wiles or the, the attacks or the strategies or the plans of the devil. So immediately the church is made aware that we are in a conflict with what, what Paul is calling the wiles of the devil as Christians. He said, you have to put on the whole armor of God. Now, it's very interesting in the verse 10, just by way of connection, he says, finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. He commands them to be strong. You see, what he's alluding to is that without this particular strength that is mentioned in verse 10, without this, he said, you're going to be very vulnerable. It's possible to be born again and to be vulnerable to the devil. It's possible to be a child of God and to know that you're going to heaven and still be vulnerable to the wiles, the attacks, the strategies of the devil. And so he says to them, you need to put on the whole armor. But he reminds them in verse 10, he says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. What is he saying? He said, you'll have to be strong because in yourself, you're weak. Even as a Christian, you're weak. He said, you're going to have to be strong. But he said, I'll have to, I have to make you aware of the type of strength that you will require. He said, there, there will be no point whatever in, in coming with all your own personal resources and strength and knowledge and all the things that you have resources and, and kind of strength. And he said, that will be of no avail whatever. He said, you must be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. In other words, you're going to have to have a resource, a power, a strength that is not your own. It is something you are going to have to take, something you're going to have to receive if you are going to overcome the wiles of the devil. As I said, the first thing is the awareness, and Paul was making them aware. If there's any pride among you, if you feel that you're well able to face life as a Christian, and you feel that you're landed and that you know everything, Paul said, I want to burst your bubble. I want to bring you back to the planet, no matter how, uh, how intelligent you are, no matter how much reason or knowledge you have of the things of God, no matter how wonderful your conversion was, he said, I want you to be aware that without the power of the Lord, you're weak. He said, I'm going to give you a strength, though, that will overcome this power. It's called the power of the Lord. Now, when we turn to the Old Testament, to the book of Joshua, which is actually a mirror book of the New Testament book of Ephesians. They're mirror books of each other. They're both to do with warfare. 
with possessing land, with doing God's will, both books. And when we come to the book of Joshua, we discover very early on that he finds himself uh, going to <clears throat> take Jericho. And he's been led by the Lord to that place, and he's ready for conflict. And on one occasion, he's, he's standing by, and as he's standing, a man comes to him. And he hasn't recognized this man before. He doesn't recognize him as one of his soldiers or commanders. And he turns to this unique man that has appeared. And he said, uh, are you for us or are you against us? Well, who are you? And the response of this man who is the Lord, who is, is, the, is the Lord of glory in human flesh, the pre incarnate Christ, Christ before the incarnation. The Lord didn't say, I'm for you. And the Lord didn't say, I'm against you. But what he did say was, I'm the captain. In other words, I'm taking over. In other words, what he was saying was, you're asking the wrong question because sometimes we can say, uh, Lord, are you for us? Are you against us? Uh, that's not the right question. The, cr the question we need to ask, am I for the Lord? That's what we need to ask. Am I for the Lord? Because he's the captain. And that's all you have to find out. Am I for him? And so he became captain and they followed him and they saw a great victory. And so in like manner, the Lord will grant to us his strength to be victorious over all the strategies of the devil. But then the scripture says in verse 11, to defeat and stand against the wiles, that is plural, of the devil. The wiles of the devil. There's more than one. I remember a, a gentleman used to say the devil is, uh, he has got a recipe book. You know these uh, cooks, the recipes. And you can put a recipe out for one person and it's beautiful and for another it's not. For one, it's very appetizing. For the other, it's not. So in like manner, the devil has a particular um, work that he can do to present to you from his book that particular recipe that he presents to you to get you from following the Lord. That's, that's how he works. The devil and his minions of demons know us individually and personally. We are known. And we'll see that again in a moment. You see, friends, uh, there are many, many adjectives that describe uh, the devil. Many ways we can, he is described in the New Testament. Here's, here's a few of them. The devil is described as the hinderer. The hinderer. Did you ever feel hindered in your Christian walk? Did you ever feel there's someone holding you back? The first thing that's necessary is the awareness that this entity exists, the awareness that I can be hindered, that I can be prevented by this devil from doing what God wants me to do. He's also described as the murderer, the murderer. He's described as a liar telling lies. He's the tempter. He tempts. He's the author and the one who instigates under by his uh, demini uh, uh, demonic entities around the world, instigating temptation in order to lead people to sin, in order that any fellowship or communion with God can be severed so that man is permanently cut off from his creator, and therefore doomed to death. That is the methods that he uses. He's called the slanderer. The slanderer. He's called the great deceiver. And if we were to speak of persecution today in our land, I would have to say that the primary battle for, by way of persecution today is that of the mind. It's the arena of the mind for the Christian where the battle is going on. And that's why the Bible says that we must gird up the loins of our mind. Satan attacks the mind. Satan seeks to get po possession 
of the mind, to hold the mind. And if one was to uh, consider, uh, for example, generally media today, and look at uh, the flow of media and the flow of what society believes and accepts and embraces today, you will recognize that it's contrary to the Word of God. It is contrary to what God teaches. The Bible says in the Old Testament, to a nation, woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. We live in that day when evil is called good. And good under God's eye is called evil. We live in that day. Not only have we vulnerability mentioned in this passage, but we have the unseen enemy. Now, I mentioned at the beginning that this is a, an unveiling, an opening of an area that otherwise would be a little more vague to us if we were to continue as Christians without Ephesians 6. Because when we come to verse 12, there is a sudden revelation. Now, it's, it's a skeleton. It's not detailed. He doesn't go into all the areas that we would love him to do. Wouldn't it be lovely, uh, I sometimes think, if he would have given a real depth a look at these entities. But he didn't. He didn't. And God's wiser than we are. For we wrestle not. Well, a man preached a sermon on that on one occasion. To the church, he said, we wrestle not. And he finished there. And of course, that's true of the church. We wrestle not. But we ought to be wrestling. And the child of God who is not experiencing something of wrestling is not really going forward with God. It is impossible to be a spirit-filled Christian and not encounter a wrestling with demonic entities where you are fighting and you know that you are fighting against an unseen yet real opponent. When a child of God is not spirit-filled, very often this type of language is foreign. They cannot really comprehend what you're talking about because their spiritual experience is limited to the intellect. Most Christianity in Northern Ireland is intellectual Christianity. It's good, solid, thorough doctrine, but it has never been worked through the heart. And as a result, the Christians are all little um, weaklings instead of giants. And there are few spiritual giants in the land now. And that's the reason. We have more truth than we can handle, but we're not working it through. You don't believe me? Go to the average church prayer meeting. Because if there ever was a place where wrestling should go on, it's in the place of prayer. But the average church prayer meeting will start at 9 o'clock after the Bible study, and it'll all be wrapped up at half nine. There's not a lot of wrestling. But the great saints of the ages, and in great times of movement of the Spirit in the church, there is a great wrestling goes on. There's great conflict with the powers of darkness, and great prevailing over them as the glory and power of God is unveiled on a community and men and women and children are transformed by the power of the everlasting gospel. An unseen enemy. So here he presents to us the skeleton of demonic hierarchy. He said, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. And what he's presenting to us are various layers of demonic power. Under the devil, he has his own military commanders. Under them, there are subservient powers. Until we come to the very bottom, where there are demonic powers that we call demons operating right around the globe. And so he paints this picture for us to recognize that the devil has a kingdom. The devil works not on his own, but has a great multitude 
of these fallen beings working with them for the overthrow of the kingdom of God and the destruction of man. This unseen enemy we must recognize is not flesh and blood. The average Christian at the end of their journey, what they say is, well, I fought this one and I fought that one. And I fell out with this Christian and I fell out with that one. Well, on the journey of even following the Lord, you may find yourself in trouble with the saints. In fact, it's, it's invariable that's what will happen. Now, the Bible says you should try to live at peace with all men as much as you can. But if you're in a world living for Jesus Christ and the world loves the devil and is under his domain, do you expect to be loved by that world? No, my friend. I remember I may have told this before, but the late um, servant of God, Leonard Ravenhill, said of A.W. Tozer, and they were sitting together, and Tozer read out a little uh, article, an obituary from the newspaper in America. And it said this man, says his name was Archie, Archie lived to 91, and then it talked a bit about him, and then it said at the bottom, he never made an enemy in his life. And Tozer turned around to Ravenhill and said, what a waste of a life. What a waste of a life. 91 years, never made an enemy. My friend, if you love the Lord Jesus Christ, you will make enemies. If you follow God and you're open to the Holy Spirit, you will make enemies. The devil will see to it that enemies are raised against you, both without the church and within it. And within it. And sometimes the greatest hostility and hatred against you will come from the church and from people professing to be followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, what we need to recognize as Christians is that our battle is not with flesh and blood. You see, friend, if all you can see at the end of your day and the end of your life that I fought with this one and that one, you have missed it. Because my Bible tells me that my conflict is not with flesh and blood. It's not with people. Now, people may be the receptacle that the devil may use, but it's not the person. It's the power behind them. It's the influence that's upon them. Whenever this man, Judas, of his, Judas Iscariot, came in before the Lord Jesus, the Bible says that Satan entered him. Satan came into him. And Satan caused him to betray the Lord Jesus. The devil's behind him. He's the arch enemy of light. And we need to recognize as Christians that our opponent is not the people of God, even they're against us. It's not the world, even they're against us. Our opponent is the devil. And we must remember that and understand it when we come to prayer. We need to understand it when we're dealing with people and recognize that there's powers behind this. Sometimes conflicts that occur among the people of God, if there was just a little more spirituality, just a little more humility, we would be able to step back and say, isn't it obvious to us it's the devil? Isn't it obvious that the devil has caused this conflict to occur between us? Isn't it obvious that the devil has come to bring this wall between us that the Lord Jesus never wanted to be there? But very often there is a lack of humility. There is a lack of insight spiritually to see that this can happen. And so there, we must recognize our enemy to be not flesh and blood. But also we need to recognize that it's close combat. The Bible uses the term wrestle. And that means exactly what it means, wrestle. Don't be thinking that when demonic powers are fighting against you as a spirit being in love with the Lord Jesus, that that conflict is away, pie in the sky, away up over thunder. My friend, it's here. It's here. This conflict is here. Whether you see it or not, whether you're aware of it or not, it's here. I'm often reminded of a man who had, I forget, uh, uh, I forget his name, Ian Oh, his name will come to me, but he had a quite a unique experience, this man. It was a, a kind of a near-death experience. And he had this vision where he had died and come back again and so on. And God miraculously raised him from the dead. Raised him up. Wish you could remember his name. Ian McCormick. McCormick, thank you. Ian McCormick. A very interesting story. Not all might agree with it, but nevertheless, the evidence at the end of the day is 
The man was not only restored to life again, but he has become a powerful evangelist for the Lord. From the moment he wakened from what he stated to be dead, he said, from that moment onwards, God has used that man in leading multitudes to Jesus Christ. And Ian McCormick said something I find very interesting whenever he had been in that near-death experience where he sensed that he had been in hell, he sensed that he saw heaven. There are many things that he felt he saw, and that's, as I say, controversial. That's not what I'm talking about. But one thing I find very interesting was when he said that he was raised again, when he got his life back and he, he rose up in the mortuary and sat up and frightened the nurses, as you can imagine he would do. Whenever that happened, he said for a number of days subsequent to that, he could see spirits around people. In other words, he could have told what the problem was in that person's life. He would have seen a spirit of lust sitting on a person's shoulder. He would have seen a spirit of pride on another person. And he knew what was wrong with them. And what I found very interesting was that that totally complements and, and is in total agreement with the Bible because the Bible says we wrestle. It's close combat. We're in a battle. The Bible says that. Of course, you and I, as Christians, being made aware of that, we should desire that, Lord, there would be none of these entities holding on to me, but that I would be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might, that I would be an overcomer. And that these spirits, these enemies would not be there to hinder and suppress and beat me down, but by the power of the resurrection, by the power of the Holy Spirit, I would be a great overcomer. And I would do God's will and be an overcomer of the kingdom of darkness and of hell. Close combat. The enormity of the enemy. Now, I know that some of you might be thinking, here he's given the devil some glory tonight. Don't worry. Don't worry. It's very important that I do this. Very important. Because the average Christian believes that I can do this. I've come to the Lord, and I can do it. I can, you know, I go to church, go to meetings, go on a missionary trip, get to know the Bible a little, get into a good evangelical church, go to an odd prayer meeting. I can do it. I can do it. I can be this Christian. I can be this thing. My friend, you can't. You can't. A thousand times over, you can't. You can't. Because this life has to be lived in the power of the supernatural. Otherwise, the devil can stand in all your trying and attempting and all your legalism and your rules, and the devil laughs at you. He laughs at you. Why? Because you, you do not know the power of the Lord. You do not know the empowering of the Holy Spirit. And as you lack that empowering of the Holy Spirit, so all your efforts are largely vain. So why am I telling you about this enormous enemy, this huge kingdom that surrounds the earth, this, this entity called the devil, this fallen angel? Why it's important that you, to some extent, recognize the size, the power, the force of this enemy is to recognize that you can only be victorious when you abandon your life completely to Jesus Christ and you are filled with the Holy Ghost. No other way to be an overcoming Christian. I don't care if you're a Baptist or a Pentecostal Elam, if you sing all day with your hands in the air, or whether you keep them by your side. I don't care what, what uh, religious or theological view you hold. I really don't care. My friend, this is a spiritual battle, not a theological one, not a mental one, but one against a real, demonic, strong entity. In the book of Exodus, chapter 17, we have the story of Moses. Amalek's in the battlefield. Now, I want you to imagine it as I illustrate it. They've decided to have an evangelistic campaign. You don't hear many about those now in churches. Christians aren't interested in evangelism anymore. Talk to any evangelist, he'll tell you that. 
Years ago, Christians could have had evangelists. The evangelists were being called from every church, come and do a mission. People are not interested in that anymore. There's no interest in winning the lost. That tells me that the devil has deceived the church. That tells me that the church is drifting away from God. Even though they've put on their big buildings and even though they've got great finances, the devil's not one bit concerned about how much money you have or how big a building you have. He couldn't care tuppence. Not tuppence. The devil's only afraid when men and women become ablaze with the power of the Holy Ghost. That's all. And nothing less. Nothing less. He's not frightened of any of these tactics that we use and these human methods. I want you to imagine it. Exodus 17. Moses and Aaron and a young man called Joshua decide we're going to have a gospel mission. And the devil is a group of beings called the Am Amalekites. So we're going to have to fight them. Okay? So what happens is Joshua is sent down. He's the evangelist. And he goes on to the field and he starts his evangelism. But he's not doing it too long until the life's beaten out of him. And he's thrashed by the Amalekites. Beating the life out of him. And he's doing everything he can. And he's using all the tactics he can. And he's using all the equipment he can. But he's getting nowhere. He's getting nowhere. Not working. And that's why many churches and many Christians have given up on evangelism today is because they have done everything that Joshua had done on the field, but they were beaten. And they said, it's not working. It's not working. We're not getting there. Ah, but then we have this very important truth. Moses is not on the ground. Moses is not flailing about the soul. Moses goes up the mountain. He holds his hands up in the air and his hands are assisted by his brother called Aaron and her and they hold them up. And when his hands are up, they have their eye on the battle. And guess what's happening on the battle? When their hands are up, Amalek's being defeated. Joshua's prevailing. Souls are being saved. The work of God is prospering. Great things are happening on the level, on the earth, because there are those who are up on the mountain and they know how to deal with the devil. Behind every true awakening, behind every move of the Holy Spirit, you will find praying, interceding men and women full of the Holy Ghost, waiting on God, hearing from God, taking authority over the powers of darkness. And as they do, eventually that translates into victory on the earth. But if you forget that, you can forget this. If you don't learn how to fight up there, you're not going to see any victory down here. That's the way it is. You see, friends, finally, they had to put on armor. He said, wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. Now, we'll not go through all the details, but I want you to notice that they needed to do something. They needed to do something. Have you as a Christian ever done what the Bible commanded you to do? Have you ever taken on the whole armor of God? You ever done that? Child, I don't know what you're talking about. I heard I needed to be born again. I got born again about 40 years ago. That's all ever I done. Well, that's all right, my friend. But what are you going to do when you arrive in heaven and you're put into the dumpsters class? What if God puts you into a wee baby class where you learned nothing? Don't be the, Listen, people have this, uh, in Northern Ireland, there's this real weird belief that when you get to heaven, just, you just trusted Jesus, you invited him to be your savior, and when you get to heaven, there's going to be rewards, just mean God's just going to pour them on you, you're going to get that many crowns in your head, your, your neck will break, you're going to, God is just going to pour. Listen, I don't know where you got that from. My Bible tells me that the Lord Jesus will say to those who obeyed him, who did his will, well done, good and faithful servant. My Bible tells me that. But God is not going to tell lies at that. If you haven't done well, he's not going to say well done. That's not going to happen. Not going to happen. You need to do something. You can't be passive as a Christian. Just sit there. 
It says, put on the armor. This armor is putting on righteousness. It's putting on the Christian life. It's, it's living the life. It's living the... You see, the breastplate of righteousness means I'm righteous. I'm, I'm being righteous. I'm seeking under God to be right with God, to be right with my fellow man, to be right with my family, so that I, I have this righteousness on me. But if you're not living righteously, then you're not going to be protected. You, you, you need the, the weaponry on. And the Bible says you have to put it on and put it on by faith. Not only do you put it on, but finally you have to use it. Hmm. Now, generally the experience of the saints is this. And this may sound, some of this may be foreign to individuals and for others it might not. But let me nevertheless say Whenever a person pursues God in their Christian walk to be filled with the Holy Spirit and to walk with God, one of the first things that be they begin to recognize is that they are in this battle. The Holy Spirit reveals that to them. They become aware of it personally that there's this battle ongoing. Because while the Lord did not in the book of Ephesians 6, give us the detail, the skeleton. He didn't give us the details that we would like about the enemy. God didn't do that. It'd be a big, big book if he did, but he didn't. But you know what he did do? He gave us the Holy Spirit. And do you know what the Holy Spirit can do? The Holy Spirit can hunt out whatever the devil's doing around us. And do you know what the Holy Spirit can do? He can tell us what's going on, and he can tell us what we need to do, and he can tell us how to be an overcomer. And as we listen to him, as we trust him, as we lean on him, he will make us overcomer. So it doesn't matter what strategy that the devil uses, as we lean on the Lord, as we trust in him, as we depend on him, we can be overcomers. That's the wonderful thing about the person of the Holy Spirit. He can always outwit the devil. You know, there was a man during the Welsh Revival. His name was Evan Roberts. He's renowned for, of course, being the evangelist. And he traveled all over Wales. And there was 100,000 saved. 100,000. Can you imagine the change to a community? Well, 100,000 saved. But the interesting thing is he wrote a wonderful book with a lady called Jessie Penn Lewis. And you know what the book was called? War on the Saints. And that book is not about revival. It's not about the Lord coming through in power in what we consider revival. But it's about his insights to the tactics and methods that the devil used on him during the revival. And the wonderful thing about that book is how the Lord taught him by the power of the Spirit to overcome the most wicked strategies of the devil. He overcame because he had the power of the Lord. He had the power of the Spirit. Forgive me for using a personal illustration, which I've used before, but it's the most powerful one I know, certainly for me anyway. I've mentioned this many times before in relation to missions, but I conducted a mission many years ago, and God was pleased to bless, and many came to the Lord. But afterwards, my wife and I experienced a real counterattack. And I didn't believe at that stage as a Christian that, that what did occur could occur. I didn't believe that. I believed in the devil. I believed that he existed and so on. And I was glad to be preaching the gospel and even gladder to see people getting saved. But God brought me very suddenly into a school that I did not know existed. And when I was thrown into that school and subsequent to that mission, literally all hell seemed let loose on us as a family and on our home to the extent that our home became so oppressed and so heavy and such a fearful environment that even when we got up in the morning and there was a beautiful sunny day, we were afraid. I was afraid uh, to walk into the bathroom on my own. I was afraid to walk down the stairs into my living room on my own. It was tangible fear. It was something I'd never experienced before, and I knew it was the devil. I knew it was the devil. 
But I didn't know what to do. And I traveled. That lasted for a number of days. And yet during that, the amazing thing was, I'll not go into detail, but the Lord, no matter what the devil seemed to do, God very graciously would do something to give us a wee bit of encouragement. Do you know the Bible says when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will raise a standard against him? And we were in the vortex of a real deep battle on ground where there seemed no safety and security. And it seemed the enemy was dominating. But yet God continually did that. He brought people to the house. He brought a minister, the late Barry Mander. He was a, a pastor and a friend of ours. Never had known the man and never certainly was in his church. And yet he arrived at our home. And he said God had told him to come to our home with a passage from the Bible, from one of the Psalms that he wanted to read to us. Strange things. And he stood in our kitchen and he read the psalm and then he prayed and then he left. And the amazing thing was that the psalm was exactly what was going on and that became our rock. That became the thing we held to until God gave us deliverance. Amazing how God works. But that oppression in our home was so deep, that's the way we were affected. I had gone to preach in a church and on my way to that particular church that morning, I actually felt something coming around me and upon me. And I knew it wasn't of God. And I felt as though my very life was slipping and ebbing out of my body. It was the strangest and one of the most hideous experiences I ever had. And I wondered, could I even get to the church? And I wondered, if I got there, how would I ever be able to preach? My body was just extinguished of strength. After getting through that service and getting home, I remember coming in and I threw my Bible on the table. I was so frustrated and angry. And I threw my Bible on the table in the kitchen and it fell open at Luke chapter 10. And there were two verses that were underlined. And those verses are, of course, to do with conflict, to do with fighting against the devil, where Jesus said, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. And I remember saying to my wife, we can't go on like this. This is God's home. He pays the mortgage. This, this couldn't be right that we are in this position where he's battering the life out of us and we are God's children. And so we began to pray, but pray in a particular type of manner, just not saying, Lord, please bless or help us. But we began to resist the devil. We began to say, we take authority over the power of the devil. We take authority over these spirits of fear. We take authority over this that the enemy has sent to so oppress and destroy us. We take authority over that in Jesus' name, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And when I was praying, I knew something was happening. I could feel it in my kitchen. Something's happening. There's a battle. But you know, I got tired and I sat down. And thankfully, my wife was able to pick up the, the barrier or pick up the... the uh, uh, device for, for fighting with, and she took up the baton where I had set it down, and she took in to round two. And while she was in round two, it happened. While she was praying, it happened. All that oppression, all that heaviness, all that demonic fear, all of it left. All of it left. And what a freedom came into our lives. What a lesson we learned what a lesson we learned, that we didn't need to be oppressed by the devil. We didn't need to be under this terrible tyranny, but we had a wonderful Savior who is more powerful than all the power of the devil, who is a glorious being and who longs to be in our life and reign in our life. My friend, my focus as a Christian, I want to be focused on the Lord Jesus. I want to follow the Lord Jesus. I want to love the Lord Jesus. I want to live for the Lord Jesus. And if need be, by his grace, I want to die for the Lord Jesus. I'm not looking at the devil. I'm not, I'm not taken up with the devil. But when he comes at me, I'll fight him. I'll fight him. I'll not be passive. I won't let him take control of my home. I won't let him take control of my life. I won't let him take control of my family. I will fight. In the strength of the Lord and in the power of his might. God wants us to be warriors, fighters, overcomers, victors in these dark days. And the wonderful thing 
is that the same Spirit of Jesus that dwells in me, He dwells in you. And you can be a victor. You can be an overcomer. Because Jesus is your Savior, your Lord, and your King. Let's bow in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray that you would take the truths that we have spoken tonight and that you would bury them deep in every heart. We ask that you would teach each individual here tonight how to war against this enemy. Lord, that we would become strong in you, that we would love you, Lord, that we would walk with you. O oh, loving Father, come by your Holy Spirit now. Come, gentle Holy Spirit. And to those who in their heart just now are saying, Lord, I feel inadequate for this battle. I feel so weak. I feel I don't know anything. Would you come to them now? Would you pour your grace into them? Would you pour your spirit into them? Would you make them strong in the Lord? And, oh, Father, would you have your way? Have your way. In Jesus' name, amen.